Well, thank you guys for uh, um, inviting me to uh, to give a talk today. And at uh, the beginning, when I was contacted uh, by uh, Luke, by team through Luke, uh, which I didn't really understand the intercession, uh, but I thought, oh, maybe I can use the opportunity to give you sort of like a perspective on the field of uh, uh, microwave biophysics and why is it interesting, blah, 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 and I thought that that was going to be a boring talk. <laughs> so then I decided that instead of doing that, uh, cut down on the philosophical bit and instead uh, look at something more concrete uh, that I personally find uh, I found interesting. This is a project that uh, started quite a few years ago, um, was collaboration with Richard Henshaw. Uh, and Raphael Genere. Richard used to be a PhD student with me, and now he's at ETH, and Raf was a postdoc uh, with me, and then he came here as well, uh, and he's at ANS, uh, where he started recently his own group. So we are going to spend the next half hour or so uh, talking about a microorganism called Micromonas fossilia, um, and in particular, an event, a type of event that we call a burst, uh, which you can see here is sort of slowed down uh, by an order of magnitude, and I'll try to convince you uh, that this is an interesting thing to uh, look at. Okay, so um, before we move forward, first, probably the first thing we need to uh, talk about is a little bit uh, about the uh, microorganism itself, because um, it's quite likely that uh, many of you will not be familiar with it. Uh, I wasn't until I started to work with it. Um, is a Photosynthetic pico eukaryote, so it's a, it's a microorganism, it's an algae, it's photosynthetic, it's a eukaryotic microorganism, so not a bacterium, for those of you who are not, who are far from, uh, removed from biology, uh, but it's small, so that's why the pico is about a couple of microns in uh, cell body size, so it's as big as a bacterium, but it is a eukaryote. Um, it's globally dispersed, so it's a cosmopolitan uh, pico alga, and it's considered dominant in a sector of the uh, 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 of the microorganisms uh, in the Arctic, in the Mediterranean, in all Pacific, so in several areas of the global ocean. Uh, in 2014, it was discovered to be mixotrophic. Uh, so there has been, to my knowledge, uh, quite a few uh, claims that mixotrophy is abundant in the microbial world. Uh, I am not a microbial ecologist, okay, so full disclosure. But I find it quite interesting. It was proposed that uh, due to the fact that, that uh, global temperatures are going up and therefore actually primary production of micromonas is going up in particular in the Arctic. But this is not the strain that we'll uh, be uh, talking about today, but it is a related one. Um, this was poised to be the main microorganism regulating bacterial abundance in the Arctic, which um, is uh, it's quite, a, it's quite a feat. However, it isn't quite settled, okay? So the jury is still out on whether the organism, the report of mixotropy is still, is actually correct or not. Okay, so for what concerns uh, my group, um, we have, well, I mean, I'm interested in microbial motility. And so when I started to work on microonas was because I found that its motility was quite interesting. So motility is not very well characterized and it has several interesting features. So it has a peculiar uh, type of flagellum. So for those of you who don't know what flagella and cilia are, so these are um, organelles that are common to uh, essentially all eukaryotic microorganisms. The species that don't have it have lost it. So it is an organelle that is poised to be already present in the last initial or common ancestor of the eukaryotes. So the, um, they have, they're very highly conserved and they have a typical structure in particular for the ones that move. So, for example, in, uh, in, in our body, we have cilia flagella in the lungs, in the brain that move the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Obviously, sperm, the tail of sperm is a flagellum. Uh, all of these are types of flagella that move and they share a structure called a nine plus two flagellum. So, you have a nine microtubule doublets that surround the central pair. So, in general, the whole structure moves from the base to the tip of the flagellum. So, it's built all the way through. In this case, there is only a stub of a couple of microns that is a nine plus two, and then you have the central pair that moves, that protrudes for several microns. And this is very bizarre. It's very bizarre and apparently is related to the type of propulsion that the cell has, uh, which can lead the, the cell to move either forward or backward uh, through a mechanism that essentially associates the rotation of a helical filament 
uh, with propulsion. So if you think about rotating a fusilli in water, if you rotate it in one direction, you move forward. If you rotate in the other direction, you move backward. So this cell, this, this species realizes the same mechanism that bacteria move, that bacteria used to move with their flagellum, which is a completely different type of beast altogether, but realize the strategy is the same, but it's realized with the eukaryotic flagellum. Um, it is also being reported to be strongly attracted to the MSP already in the micromolar range. And if there was uh, in the 60s a report of strong phototaxis, meaning that the cell manages to move towards light rapidly. Uh, and essentially, there was no further work. Okay. And so essentially, this is, in, this is an interesting species, both from the biomechanical perspective and for uh, the point of view of the, its, its uh, motile reaction uh, to environmental stimuli. And it's actually this phototaxis that drew me, drew me. Okay, so this, when I read this, I was like, okay, this is quite interesting. And the reason why I found it interesting uh, is uh, it's something that I, I couldn't resist. I had to um, uh, discuss uh, uh, a little bit, just a little bit. So I'll give you a sort of phototaxis intermezzo. Um, and the reason is that this is not your vanilla type of phototaxis. What do I mean by that? So the standard way in which uh, Photosynthetic eukaryotic microorganisms move towards light is essentially the one that is followed by a much larger organism, it's about 10 microns in diameter, called Chlamydomonas reinfecti. So this is, uh, this is a, a freshwater uh, microalga, and essentially it manages to move towards light by the use combined use of three elements: the flagella, so it has two flagella instead of one. The eye spot, which is essentially a light sensitive organelle, if you want, is a one pixel camera. And the spinning of the cell. Okay, so I will not dwell into how it manages to use this to do that. We can talk about it later if you want. But these ingredients are essential um, for it to do phototaxis. And here you see in, in, uh, in real time cells accumulating uh, around a, a optical fiber when the, fi when the light from the fiber is being formed. Now, the, this, is, um, this means that this contrasts a lot with micromonas because in micromonas you have a single flagellum and you have no ice cream. So therefore you have an issue with steering. So how does it move, how do you move, how do you change the direction move towards light? And you have an issue with detection, meaning I cannot, I don't have any eye to detect where the light is coming from. How do you move towards light? So this is the reason why I found it interesting and we have done a reasonable amount of work both at the population and the individual level to um, show that the, uh, uh, at the population level, the phototactic drift towards light is quite small and is essentially an all, all or none type of response um, where, whereby the cell moves towards the light if the intensity is above a certain threshold, but regardless of the, of this, uh, of this uh, color in the spectrum and doesn't if it is below. Uh, and essentially we believe that this uh, is to counter sedimentation. And we have also done experiments at the individual level where we have tried to understand how this drift is implemented from a motile perspective. And this, um, and what we found is that the cell manages on average to detect the direction or to move towards the, the direction that is coming from with a precision of about 40 degrees, so plus minus 20 degrees, uh, which we believe is related to um, a, a phenomenon called cell lensing uh, that is uh, due to the fact that the cell has a different index of refraction than the surrounding environment. So it acts as a micrometric lens and it uses the, uh, um, we believe it uses the uh, intensity, the differences in intensity within the cell to detect where, what is the direction of light. This is not so far fetched because actually, believe it or not, there are some um, bacteria, cell bacteria that do exactly this, okay? So the size is exactly the same, and the mechanism can be a case of evolutionary convergence. Anyway, we're not here to talk about this now, but I just wanted to mention that as we were working on this, uh, while looking at the individual level uh, phenomenology, we started to observe phenomena like this, okay? So every once in a while, you see something uh, that was like a burst of activity. So how do we observe this? Um, we, uh, we decided to, uh, we, well, the way that we were um, uh, trying to visualize this phenomena 
was if you want the simplest way possible. So we have a small uh, microfluidic chamber. Uh, this is made of a, a kind of elastomer that is uh, breathable. And therefore, you can the cells can live in there with no problem. Uh, so you fill this chamber with your suspension, then you put it on, on top of a microscope, and you just observe it, right? So you observe it as far for as far as you want. The uh, light that we use to observe is not detected by the cells, and therefore, essentially, we are looking at the way that they move in a way that is not um, subject to stimul environmental stimulation. So when you do that uh, and you start to track the cells, so you can do automatic tracking. Um, you start to realize, first of all, the way that normally cells move. And these are two standard trajectories. So you see that the cells essentially, what they do is they wait and then they jump in other position and they wait and they, and they jump in other position. So essentially what you have is that conceptually the way you can think of these things moving as, as, um, be, as, going, as undergoing a series of runs and stops. And then you can either continue or reverse. So we can call it a run, stop, and reverse. If you want, it's not a particularly uh, uh, it's not a particularly imaginative uh, name, but it, it gives the point. So just a, a few numbers. The typical speed is of the order of uh, ten um, body lengths per second, so thirty microns per second. This is typical. So microorganisms usually very often move at about ten body lengths per second. They run for about six seconds. And then the run duration is about a quarter of a second. Okay, so actually, most of the time, what they do is they wait. Okay, so the uh, the the stop periods are about a second. Um, they are sort of they can they distribute themselves the waiting times in an exponentially decreasing probability distribution function, which tells you that this is a very simple process. This is a Poisson process. Okay, every time. You do and you wait an extra amount of time. You have a fixed probability of ending your waiting, uh, your wait essentially, and start to move. This is the most vanilla type of process you can have. Okay. Um, by the way, just uh, in parentheses, this sort of stop and uh, and run motion. So this burst and stop and burst and stop and burst and stop. This is something quite common in marine bacteria and is uh, poised to be a way to avoid predation, to minimize the hydrodynamic uh, sort of um, hydrodynamic signature that you can have in the environment and therefore don't give, avoid giving clues to uh, grazers so that you are not eaten. Obviously, if you just wait, you don't give any clues, but then you forego the ability to move somewhere. Okay, so um, just another curiosity, you can also get the orientation um, probability distribution function. Uh, which fits very well um, in so, sort of like standard uh, the orientation by diffusion. So essentially you have a rotation diffusivity, and then you can either, once they diffuse, decide to keep on moving in the same direction relative to your body that you were moving up before or move back. This is the origin of the two peaks here. Um, and when you do that, you realize that this must be an active reorientation. So the cell is actively doing something with the flagellum in order to run, uh, in order to increase the randomization of its direction. Again, this is something that happens in marine bacteria. Okay, so here we see quite a few parallels between this, which is a eukaryote, but that's the same size as a bacterium and a marine bacteria. Okay, so the reversal is about 50%. Uh, okay, so um, one day um, I was uh, talking to Richard and uh, he was like, I found something weird. Okay, so he was just looking down at the normal sample and then he told me, so burst event there, another burst event there. And he thought this is bizarre. And, uh, um, and I would like to see, I would like to, to try and characterize it a little bit more. And I'm telling you this story because um, for two reasons. The first one is that I want to encourage people, in particular young people, people that don't have white hair yet, um, to uh, sort of keep an open mind and uh, look at weird things that you do not expect because most often these are the most important, most uh, exciting things that can come out of research, right? It's the so-called unknown unknowns, as uh, Ransford was saying. And the second is that, as Yogi Berra was saying, you can observe a lot by just watching. Okay, so remember, 
uh, this, uh, this is the only piece of philosophy that I have in, uh, in, the, in the presentation. Okay, so after struggling a little bit on how to characterize these burst events, uh, how, to quanti how to quantify the, uh, the events that we were seeing, we managed to converge on a mechanism, sorry, mechanism, a, a technique that depends on the local correlation with excessive frames, which really brings out uh, very clearly what happens as the front is developing. Okay, so <clears throat> these things are important because if you want to be able to quantify uh, a behavior, you need to be able to get data from which you can get uh, clear uh, numbers. Okay, so from these numbers, from this sort of data, you can get the duration. So this is a, is a histogram of the duration that we have observed. Uh, so it, it lasts of the order of two or three seconds, something like that. This should be contrasted with the other duration of around that I told you about before in the unstimulated case, which is a quarter of a second. So this is uh, about six times as long as a normal run of a cell. And the second is the dynamics of the expansion front. Okay, so this is an example of the expansion from dynamics of the radius as a function of time. And here you can distinguish two different parts. There is the first part, which is dominated by the expansion of the trigger front. So it's the front that is expanding, is triggering more and more cells. And then there is a second part, which is dominated instead by the cell motion. So the cells that have been already triggered that uh, ex expand, if you want, beyond or, fa or faster than the uh, uh, motion of the front. This is quite interesting because, in particular, in this part, uh, the curve can the curve essentially follows the square root of time. So square root of time, if you remember, means diffusion, and so you can actually extract from this a diffusivity. So the diffusivity of the front is of the order of ten to the minus ten meters square per second. This is the diffusivity of a molecule. Okay, so just to give you an idea, the NSP has a diffusivity in these units that goes between ten to the minus ten and ten to the minus nine. Okay, so there is a molecule that is diffusing here and is generating the expansion of the front. Okay, so once we saw that there was a molecule, we were like, okay, where is this molecule coming from? It, it has to come from one of the cells. So for example, it could come because by some reason, one of the cells dies. So we, we uh, decided that perhaps we could test this with laser ablation. Okay, so you have your suspension, you put your suspension under a microscope with a laser that is used usually to cut, for example, cutting embryos. And instead of cutting an embryo, you can burst the cell. So you just zap it, zip, and the cell bursts. Okay, so here is a control. So the cell, the, um, the, de the designated, is the opposite of the designated survivor. So it's the designated, uh, well, the guy that has to die, um, is, uh, is the target cell is here, and then the laser ablation is going to be on the cross. So if you ablate close to the cell, but not on the cell, nothing happens. But if you have like on the cell immediately after you get the uh, development of uh, this activity, front of activity of the surrounding cells. Okay, so what this shows us is <clears throat> that these bursts can be triggered by the lysis of a neighboring cell. Okay, so if a neighboring cell lysis, then this is going to happen. And there might be also something, something else that makes them happen. But for sure, if the cell lyses, then you get this personal activity. <clears throat> okay, so let's try to gather together the, the, these different pieces of information that we have um, and try to see whether uh, this idea, uh, whether we can, we can test whether this idea makes sense. Okay, so in order to do that, um, you can do a minimal model. Okay, so what type of minimal model could we talk about uh, in this case? So we have our happily doing nothing micromonas, one of them be becomes sick and it starts to die, leaches out material, material something in, that was in the cell starts to diffuse out, and as this front is diffusing out, at a certain point, the neighboring cells will start to activate. Okay, so burp a little bit and then the other ones. So obviously this essentially means that I have an initial block here, which then will diffuse out, and there has to be a threshold. And when, if I'm sitting here, when the sig local signal goes above the threshold, I will activate. So let's have to put some maths. I, I will have 
if maths in a few places, uh, so some of you are physicists, I don't have to tell you anything, no apologies, but for those of you who are not familiar, maybe not physicists or not scientists, I'll try to uh, make it as uh, intuitive as possible. Uh, it's not difficult, it's just a bunch of symbols. Uh, so we have the mass of the diffusing chemical from the light itself, the sensitivity threshold here, so M and gamma, and then the diffusivity of the from, this is the diffusivity the, that I measured before. Okay, so if you put these things together, the location of the front, the current location of the front, uh, that relates to the uh, to the to the current time through this relation. Uh, it might seem bizarre, but it's actually quite easy because it's just saying the location of that point in a Gaussian. Okay, so that means that the front progression has to follow an equation like that, and in particular, because this is the square root. At a certain point, this is going to become negative. This is a minus sign. This is originally is negative. So it's less than one. So therefore, this is negative. So this is positive. When this becomes more than one, because time is increasing, this will all become negative. And then I have no solution there, which means that there is a maximum extent of the front. This maximum extent of the front has to be given by, uh, or according to the model, is given by that uh, equation. So it depends on the relation between how much stuff I release and my sensitivity uh, to, the, to the cubic root, and then there is a, there is a numerical perfactor factor before. So notice that this is independent of the diffusivity, okay? So it does not depend on how fast or how, or how uh, slow the, the, the diffusing molecule is. Um, it only de depends on how much stuff is released and how much is my threshold uh, sensitivity. Obviously, there is something that depends on the diffusivity. The time at which this is reached depends on the diffusivity, but the extent does. So let's put some, some numbers in. So um, I have no idea what this M is, but there are people that have measured, for example, the DNSP content of micromoles. And the uh, uh, estimate is that the, each cell contains an average of three times 10 to the minus 16 moles of DNSP. This is interesting because we also know that uh, microlens is sensitive to the sensitivity threshold is a micromolar. Okay, so I know that and I know that, and therefore I can predict that the maximum extent of these patches should be 30 microns. So you put these numbers in and you, you get that. It's pretty good, I have to say, because the maximum extent that we get here before the before the cells just take over is about 40 microns. So this I would say in my book, this is not a bad uh, estimate. I was, when, I, when, I st when we started to put the numbers in, we could have, I was expecting to get something like a millimeter or a, a nanometer, but we are actually within a factor of you know, one and a half. Okay, this is one thing. Um, and essentially this tells us that, uh, um, well, this sort of hints that we are in the correct direction. But at the same time, it poses another question. Okay, fine. I know this chemical is coming out and uh, I activate it, but why? I mean, why bother? And why should I do it? Why, why don't they just stay there? And here enters the fact that uh, Micromonas is blighted by viruses. Okay, so um, here you see an example of what I'm talking about. Here is Micromonas, and this is decorated by uh, the Micromonas viruses. In fact, nowadays, Micromonas viruses uh, and, and its viruses are a model system to study the uh, virus post interaction in this type of microorganisms. So, in other words, the lytic viruses are one of the main causes of uh, cell death in uh, micromonas. So, the question is could this be a mechanism to prevent or at least alleviate the chance to get a viral infection? You would say, okay, maybe, but uh, does it make sense? Because after all, when I start to activate, I might be directed in the wrong direction, right? So I might go uh, towards the viruses, right? So you are triggered, and then somehow you don't actually go in the correct direction. You end up meeting your uh, creator. Um, so, well, the, the modeling, I would say, can give us sort of like, uh, can also help us give um, a little bit of an answer to this question. So, and um, I don't want, again, I don't want to enter too much into the, the, the maths, so I'll try just to outline, give it the gist of what we're doing. I'm more than happy to 
sit down and uh, discuss the maths with you if you want. So how how do you um, how do you try to answer whether this as a strategy makes sense or not? This is the way that, that we are doing. So here you have your bursting cell. So this is your frame of reference. And the bursting cell essentially releases a signal. The signal spreads with the diffusivity D signal. And it releases also viruses. The viruses spread with a different diffusivity, right? D viruses. The viruses are larger than a molecule, and therefore the diffusivity is, is lower. Okay, so in particular, they, for, for micromonas, they are viruses that uh, have a diameter of the order of 100 nanometers. Then you have the triggered cell. The triggered cell is triggered at position R star and triggered time T star. Okay, so this is the position and it's triggered at a certain time. The relation between that and that depends on the signal here. Okay. Um, and then after it has been triggered, it can react according to one of two pos uh, possibilities. I either do absolutely nothing, okay, so case one, just forward as, as, as usual, which I will uh, um, sort of write down, well, I will not write down, but I have written down as an effective diffusivity. Or the other possibility, I start to move at a certain speed, but random direction, okay? I will just pick a direction, at random and I just move at a constant speed in that direction. Okay, so from these, then you can get different concentration profiles for the future of that cell. Okay. For example, if it was just diffusing, it would be a Gaussian blob spreading. In, in the other case here is essentially is a shell moving around at a certain speed. And then from these, from these um, uh, Concentration, instantaneous concentrations, you can get an instantaneous exposure. So my exposure to the virus is the product of my concentration here at this time and the concentration of the virus here at this time. Okay, so I'm interested in this exposure. So knowing the exposure, so this is the concentration of the virus and this is the probability of this, that the cell is at that position. Knowing this exposure, I can sum over all allowed positions and times and I get the total exposure of my event. So I burst everybody else around me, how much are they exposed, case one or case two. And the result is that the exposure, right, um, the exposure will reduce, can reduce or not the, uh, sorry, the, the flea can reduce or not the exposure depending on how much and how fast you swim. So for example, uh, in this case, if, the, uh, if the cell swims for about two seconds, then you are better off moving if your velocity is, let's say, above 10 micrometers per second. And this is what happens if you still moving two seconds, move four seconds, eight seconds, and so on and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> so, given the average speed is here, it is actually much better to flee. So, much better. How much better? Well, for the exposure here, it reduces. The chance of your well, it reduces the, the amount of your exposure or the amount of exposure on the population by about 50 percent. If instead of moving two seconds, you move four seconds, it reduces uh, by about 75 percent. Is this enough or not? It just move forever, okay? In the forever here, so you can see this bit here. Okay, if you move forever, so you just keep on moving and you keep on moving, keep on moving forever. If you move very, very slowly, the, the average is skewed by the people that are moving in the wrong direction, like the guy that is moving, that was falling in the, in the pothole before, in the manhole before, right? And therefore, because those have a massive exposure, then you have the population, you're actually better off not moving for the population. Although this is just for the exposure. What is lacking here is a dynamics, which I didn't have time yesterday to, um, to actually do the, the plots, um, is the dynamics that as you are being exposed uh, is followed by you getting sick and dying, right? So the exposure is not enough. The exposure needs to lead to an, to an infection. The infection will progress. And the progress of the infection will then release the uh, uh, release more viruses. 
So it's a, it's a, more, it's a more complicated affair than just looking at exposure. But if you don't get an advantage from the exposure, you will certainly not get a better outcome once all the things, all the other things are uh, taken into account. Other questions here? Well, uh, we are at the end, I guess. Um, yeah, more or less on time. So I told you about the about the fact that micromonas is. Uh, well, I told you about uh, Micromonas in general. I hope that uh, you, will, you will be with me in uh, thinking that this is an interesting microorganism. Uh, we discussed the fact that it has a peculiar type of motility that um, I told you, I didn't show you, but I told you that um, it, it parallels what happens in marine bacteria, although this is a eukaryote. Um, and then I also told you that there is a free response that these cells um, display when neighboring cells lies. Okay, we have um, sort of outlined a small, a simple model that can predict an event horizon that makes sense with the data uh, in the order of a few tens of microns. And then we have a model that at the moment predicts a significant decrease in exposure of the cells to viruses and therefore perhaps can lead to a better outcome uh, for the cell, not for the viruses, in terms of uh, uh, in, in the event of a viral. Uh, the infection. Now, what needs to be done next? Uh, I would really like to do experiments with virus infected cells. So I've been in contact with some people in the UK and in, uh, um, in the Netherlands. Um, we all agree this is an interesting thing. So I'm looking for hands to, uh, uh, to put on the bench. And then something I did not tell you about, just, just uh, uh, hinted the fact that the uh, flagellum is quite interesting. And actually, Sarah has been. Uh, uh, involved in, uh, in a collaboration that we are starting with Pasteur Institute and Raf at DNS, uh, trying to understand how this flagellum is built. Um, because it doesn't look, it looks like there has to be a variation on the usual way that uh, eukaryotic flagella are built because of the uh, uh, structure, very peculiar structure that it has. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Um, Please. One is, I find very remarkable that there is this um, convergence between bacteria and these small uh, eukaryotic uh, organisms. So um, what I was wondering is, have you, do you have any idea of how the swimming efficiency or, or the efficiency of the, of the flagellum compares between these organisms and, and bacteria? Okay, this is an interesting question. Um, okay, the answer is no. Okay, but just for the benefit of the audience, the swimming efficiency for microorganisms is super low. Okay, so we're talking about 1% of the order, maybe one and a half, maybe two, maybe 0.5. This is the efficiency of swimming in water for microorganisms. So this has been estimated for uh, bacteria um, multiple times. Uh, there is fantastic work on uh, justifying why, or trying to argue why the flagellum has a specific shape in bacteria, um, which chimes with the uh, peaks in efficiency. Still, we are talking about a very small efficiency. Here, the thing is that we don't know how actually the shape of the flagellum as the cell is moving. So it's difficult to try to estimate what the uh, efficiency can be if you don't know the shape of the flagellum. The alternative would be to measure the flow field around, uh, but I haven't been, nobody has, has done that. So I, mean, I wouldn't expect it to be better than a bacterium. I would expect it to be but it is at least yes. competitive, no? Yes, it should be compa comparable, yes. Um, if you go quite fast, and it should be the fastest go like uh, 150 uh, microns a sec, so they really are uh, like they zip. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch this, but is it um, the chemotaxis towards? Is it towards the um, yeah. MS? Or it's towards the MSP, so the chemical is certainly not the MSP. 
but we uh, that that was the numbers that I that I got. But, but then this, this raises another question: is there is the MSP inside the inside the? the this is an excellent numbers. question. Why don't they chemo tax towards that? Okay, so it, uh, there must be a different sensitivity. I, to I have no idea. Yeah. This is a good question. I actually didn't think about that. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I don't have any answer. It would be good. So we wanted to uh, try to pin down what the molecule is, but uh, then Richard had other stuff to do. So, <laughs> so we did it. It's not, it's not going to be that, you know, these things are, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Yeah. So, uh, it's very interesting. Not that easy. Yeah, I was uh, wondering, um, you know, it's not completely out of my yeah. uh, field, but um, so these uh, micromonas, uh, it's possible that they have, I mean, they, they have like uh, relatives like eating them. Yeah, sure. So it, it would be possible that they flee the, the, the dead cell just to avoid any predator of sensing that there is micromonas there? Um, because to me, it was the, the, the first thing that they. Just... Yeah. Uh... Okay, I, I mean, it could be. I cannot, I don't have any reason to say no, but a predator, a nearby predator would give you a, more, a stronger signal than, I would, I, would, I would say that that is not the, the thing that I would base myself to, to flee from a predator. If you have a predator, you don't have a, usually what they do is they sense hydrodynamic stresses. When the stress is above a threshold, they, they, they have a response. So they, we know that they are mechanosensitive because if you shear them enough, then their mobility changes. So, but, so I would say that uh, perhaps that could be a more reliable way to escape predators. Having said that, I've not done specific experiments on predator-prey interactions with micromonas as the prey. So I haven't thought yeah. And there you go. This is my opinion. Yeah, so I so wanted to ask because I didn't uh, get very well when you were talking about the the difference between uh, different times of running in the in the uh, in this uh, you call it the, the virus uh, exposure, right? So you say that if they just run forever, there's a peak of. I mean, it, it seems to be no, worse than. Uh, no, it isn't. Uh, okay, okay, I didn't. Get no, it is worse. Uh, uh, here, it is worse if you're very if you are very slow. Okay. okay. So this is the speed of the population. As long as your speed is not ridiculously slow, then you are much better off moving. If you're ridiculously slow, the exposure is dominated by the people that choose the wrong direction. Okay because they will linger in the location of high, uh, high concentration of viruses for an enormous amount of time because they don't move, mm -hmm. right? And one question is, I can see also the question, but I don't know. I, sorry, hold on a sec. By, by the way, it just, I just, uh, just occurred to me, as, as you move down here, your Peclet number goes down. So this, have, these curves have been calculated with the, uh, with, um, with always an infinite peglin number. So no diffusivity for these molecules. This is fine above a certain threshold. It's not a good, um, a good estimate uh, below that. So if you go really slow, actually this a better model than this very simple model would, would actually uh, should smoothen this. And it cannot go above one, I think, because at least you do brown in diffusion, at least. And any motion that you do is on top of that. So this is compared with the case with Brownian diffusion. So you cannot do worse than Brownian diffusion, okay? But here, because the because of the of the fact that the Peclet number is infinite, you have we have removed the ability of this this population to diffuse away, and that's the reason why this thing goes on. So you assume that exposure happens when the cell died and the virus is released. The virus is, the, the assumption here is the virus is released by the cell that lyses, and then the viruses, yes. so, and then they spread. They spread by, by diffusion. They spread by diffusion. They, I mean, viruses don't, as far as I know, I mean, it would be really cool if they had uh, a way to move, but I don't think that they, 
that it is possible for them to to do. So. I'm not sure viruses are alive, but I don't know. But uh, again, the philosophical boundary, or like, but uh, uh, so they spread out, and then all of us who are not yet uh, infected, we are exposed to the viruses because we happen to be at the same time in the same place. Okay, and might, might be that the uh, cells also infecting already without dying. Yeah, this is not for the progression of the yeah. of the infection. Huh? This is just to know how likely is it that you're going to get infected. So, unless you die, your uh, infection will depend on the exposure, right? So there will be here. This is not the exposure itself; is proportional to the exposure. Okay, so this will be if you want to know uh, the, the infection, should you should multiply this by something like. Um, an infection, uh, an infection um, constant, or even more. I don't know because I don't do in, in I don't do viral infections. I don't know whether the chances of you being infected depends non-linearly on the uh, amount of viruses that there are around. It doesn't. In this case, this is only how many stuff we get in contact with. But how this then translates into into you being infected? That is that depends on the physiology of the organism. And uh, it's not that is not physics at, at this point. It, My question was a bit different, but maybe it's all wrong. Like, might be that the virus can leave the cell already before it dies. Um, there, is there any? I don't, is that possible? I don't know. As far as I know, these are lytic viruses. So my understanding of lytic, my stupid physicist understanding of lytic viruses is that they grow and multiply inside the cell, okay. and then the cell bursts. And once it bursts, then they are released. They are either released immediately, all of them, or more uh, progressively, let's say. Um, and here, well, I'm thinking that they're just released like that. If I'm bursting, I release the viruses. Again, yes, it can be made more sophisticated. Uh, whether this will make much of a difference or not, or not, I don't know. If the virus is managed to get out before without giving a signal, to the cell, then obviously this whole top point here is mute, right? Because then I can stealthily get to, towards you and uh, well, tough luck. And with respect to that, if you, so with the new experiment, insert some viruses, so that what you, you'd like to do, like, um, would you try to model the kind of same exposure, let's say, but with the chain reaction? Yes. So that's the next step. Yes, the, so the next step from the modeling, uh, modeling is much cheaper than doing any experiments, right? So in terms of the modeling, we can make it more complicated. We can do the population dynamics. We can just start to study that. That's fine. It's interesting. There will be some phase transitions. With, uh, the population collapses or not collapses and blah, blah, blah. Is this true or no? I don't know. Because you need to do the experiment to check. So um, what we wanted to do was to get some uh, viruses, grow them here, and then try to mix the viruses with the population and see the progression of, of the population. Um, so I've been talking to um, a person in the, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, that does this. Um, and we were thinking that perhaps a better thing was that we mix the population of cells that are all infected because she can synchronize the, the infection, which is fantastic. So you mix then that with that, and now you have you can tighter the number of cells that instantaneously are, uh, are infected. There's a much, much higher level of control. So you can do better tests of a simple model that we can write down, right? Because as you know, if you start to write down a model with 20,000 parameters, you don't really understand that. Especially with the value of biology. Exactly. So you want to, narrow down as much as possible. Um, the problem is that um, I need someone to uh, to do it. <laughs> I, need, I need time. Uh, you, I, I need human time. I need hands. So I don't know the answer, but the, um, the modeling, yes, for sure, we do that. And about the orientation of the cell, it's not a factor. It, 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 it does it make sense to look if there's a, a better or less exposure if the cell is 
uh, so in respect to the flagella position, it's oriented in such direction, in one direction or the other. You mean if he's going head first or head last, or you mean if he's moving in one direction versus another direction? If you have a bird, yeah, uh, and you're moving towards it, so you have the flagella behind yeah. in the direction. Yeah. Or if you you're you can actually have the flagella in front as well, because can, they can be either drag or pulled by the flagella. Okay. Okay. But uh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, the fluid dynamics around is different, right, by the way. No. Okay. But let's say. Uh, respect to the flagella uh -huh. direction, you, you fix direction, which is the the, the flagella. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's uh, pointing towards the burst Let's position. Say. Uh -huh. Is that a factor that will affect the how the cell will react or how fast if it was not directed towards the burst? Like you are the burst on the flagella yeah, here. I'm lost. I'm lost. I don't know. If I have the flagella in that direction, yeah. if I have the flagella in this direction. Oh, Sorry. I see. Are you thinking that maybe that sensor in some part of the sound? Uh, okay. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, you, you suggested maybe there's sensors in some part of the sound. Yeah, then, the then if the yeah, if there's a sensing, let's say that works better mm -hmm. in one position or the other, respect to the direction, the position of the bird. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be the first time the uh, flagella use the sensors. So they can sense chemicals, they can sense mechanical forces, they can also sense light. Uh, in this case, our understanding to be confirmed, right, is that the cells, when they're not moving, they have a flagell the flagellum is wrapped around the cell. I hear the view. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure that that would provide uh, much of an advantage to would provide much of us to have the sensor um, in one position versus another. But then it's, it's possible that maybe that's what they used to sense the flagella and they wrap it around so they have more uh, protection so that they can sense in all directions all the time when they're not moving. Yeah. So in, in general, the uh, in order to try to answer and answer these, for example, in Clavidomonas, uh, people have used the fact that the cell can cut the flagella with a pH shock. So you do have a culture of cells, pH shock, they shed the flagella, remove the cells, you have a your nice suspension with billions of flagella and you do proteomics from that. Uh, and here, we don't know whether the cell is capable of doing that. If the cell is capable of doing that, then it can be done. The same stuff can be done by someone who does molecular uh, biology, which is not me. It's, it's super interesting, but uh, uh, yeah, that it wouldn't be me, but it, it would be in principle if you do that, that that can be done. That can be that is a question that can be answered. And, and uh, another question: okay. Are you? We can also talk upstairs if you want. Otherwise, we keep everybody. Uh, it's fifty-two, maybe. Uh, I have okay. a question. Just for the <laughs> <laughs> so very speculative. There is a response because there are certain cells that which don't respond to. Yes. Is that correct? Is uh, the proportion of not moving cells uh, generally stable or it varies from? I don't know. We have not done analysis of the movies uh, to that level. But there are, there, there are always enough cells that don't respond that you can see them by eye. And, uh, okay. I don't know. Do you think why. my speculation is? Do you think that those that uh, which don't move, uh, this the proportion to those to the one maybe it's like a 10 percent? Something, like that. yeah, let's say that is that indicative of the uh, state of the population. It's a good question. I think the answer to that would be to try and do uh experiments at different levels of stress of the of the, of the culture. So if this, the culture is very stressed, so therefore you would expect more cells to be no motor. And if there's less stress, then you would expect potentially no cells to be not responsive. So yeah, there's a good question. I don't know. But the thing is, I, I also, I don't know why, I mean, I don't know what would the, what would the impact then be on the viral, on the spreading of a uh, viral infection. But apparently they would be more susceptible, susceptible to, to Exactly, exactly. So they say it's more a more a sick population mm. in that sense. Mm. 
Okay, let's stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Martha.